can make the complex sound easy. Maybe it isn't. Uh, maybe too easy because it's a, it's a marvelous one. So let's hear some of the things. You, you want to lead off with a briefing, one of you, of what you all have said? You can do, you have to do six miles before. I can start back there. <laughs> About 4:30 start time. Okay. <laughs> Sad but true. Why don't you use the if you want to use the mic because it might be hard to hear in the, in the microphone. Oh, we have a hand. We have a hand mic if you want. Either. Whatever you're comfortable with. Well, that way I can stand by the pictures. Hello. Hello. So we have a long discussion going through each of the questions, trying to figure out uh, really what we're going to plus teeing off of the ideas that were sparked during the conversation. And some of the ones that we're looking at is really looking at how to deliver something that's quality and meet the needs that we're looking at specifically here in the Valley. And one of the things that kind of stood out to me, and it was spurred by Maxine's question, uh, is that really the students here in the K through 12 don't really have that integration of technology basis that they might have plus the expectation of collegiate rigor within the school systems. So it's one of those is to be able to use that, the scaffolding, scaffolding process, because we are a face-to-face -face university, we are brick and mortar, we also could move towards hybrid online. So one of the things that, in my, I have a lot of ideas in the event, but one that did jump in my mind is trying to develop instead of for just traditional versus non-traditional, and trying to focus primarily on one or the other is to provide to both where the where we have a great representation of the non-traditional students here where it was more meaningful to have that hybrid online to account for the busy times work schedules and also ease of movement through the scheduling especially for classes that require more work in areas that was more content unfamiliar content and not so much less work, but less focused work where they can actually just tee on the areas that just to refine their process so they can kind of that self-directed pace. So one of the things that I thought about was maybe 100, 200 could be tailored toward preparatory of college rigor and that expectation, whether it's writing skills, the UCRs, and then move and transition, not all of them, but some of them in the 300, 400 to hybrid, um, to online, not just to have them that experience, but also it's to develop that student autonomy that is a transferable skill, personal skill, but also prepare them and acknowledge the fact that we do have individuals, quite a few here at Heritage, that they listen to us as faculty and administration saying that, well, they're going to stay in the valley. Well, they think they have to. Well, it's no, it should not be our choice, it's their choice, and prepare them for both. So if we integrate that like stepping stone methodology of scaffolding to get them to that hybrid and to online coursework, they have that option to be able to do such a thing when they look at grad school. They could stay in the valley and still go online, but that door is open to them. They'd be better prepared for that. Some of the other ones is talking about stagnation. Not everybody is really on the ball or on the mark to look at that. There is, there is a transitional stage where it's painful and sometimes it's more painful than some are going to take. So being able to realize that the brunt of that is, if you have change agents, it, being able to see that and accept that and find some type of streamlined, as I've learned, the power of communication um, is very much necessary during that time frame. So everybody is on the same page. And the element of liberal, to answer the last question, liberal education, is that the power of that is it goes back to the original mindset of what the whole renaissance man is about the and not to be colloquial or gender biased but it's that that broad spectrum understanding from it's not just understanding different viewpoints and uh, content from different skills or backgrounds but it's also to have a multi perspective where you can look in, you can see something from a philosophical, you can see something from educational, you can see something from a psychological or a mathematical or artistic viewpoint where you have that idea sharing. That's what the liberal arts provides and you can gain that. You have where, I mean, even through virtual reality right now, you can take a tour of Rome where how many individuals here have been to Rome? I'm sure by the view. I haven't been to Rome yet, but for <laughs> something. 
but it's like to be able to do that, we have things at our fingertips that we have access to that we just haven't really recognized or even the notion thought of is possible because we haven't really looked outside of, well, we haven't looked to the impossible. Do you have a, re a report out? You guys goofed off, didn't you? That's okay. No, 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 no. We, we discussed. We just didn't write. Right. I know I have a legislator here, so I mean, they don't talk at the drop of a hat, but he, he's passing. He's passing to you, sir. You know, your, your point of Google unexpected challenges, one of the, as we as, at Central move to more and more hybrid courses, uh, we had to develop com uh, laptop checkouts, I mean quarter-long checkouts, and 24-hour uh, uh, computer apps. That we had stopped doing that because they were you know, they were always empty and they were difficult to staff. But there's a lot, there's a high percentage, a surprisingly high number of students that don't have access to either a computer or to the internet uh, once they leave the campus. So a lot of our discussion really centered around the last question about uh, apprenticeships and that sort of thing. And Matthew was sharing some of his uh, research and experience with uh, the system in Germany. Uh, so we also talked about situations in Wisconsin. And, uh, and I brought up the fact that uh, in our teacher preparation program, we have one path that's a, an incredibly productive model, the residency model. However, we don't have the support for those poor men and women that are in the residency program who still have to feed their families. And so we really kind of focused on uh, on the whole apprentice part of it. Want to add anything to any of that? Sure. So one of the respondents in my research is a German-born technical college instructor, and he spoke about the difficulties in exporting that model to the United States, especially in states like Wisconsin that are anti-union. And part of the issue being, do we have a staple of employers who are ready and willing to mentor young people? And lacking that, you can't really mandate that educational institutions um, force people to do a lot of apprenticeships or internships. Um, and so that's one issue. And the other has to do with uh, pay. And so the, the tradition of unpaid internships is alive and well in our country, and it's highly problematic for a lot of young people. And that has to be addressed. And yeah, you know, there was a, a movement now, John may be able to remember this with greater clarity, maybe it was 10 years ago, even 15 years ago, that National Science Foundation funded, it was called, I believe it was Preparing Future Faculty. The notion being that probably the last surviving true guild in the United States is higher education. And most PhDs, not all, but most PhDs are, you know, bachelor's, master's, PhD, academic posting. And there isn't a lot of contact with industry along that, depending upon the kind of field that you're in. But all of the training that we get as faculty <coughs> members is at, a, is at a research university. Most of us don't work at our research universities after we graduate, or at least not for our entire career. So you, know, you talk about you know, preparing teachers. We, we may not do a great job of that in higher ed. Uh, preparing people to grapple with these sorts of issues. And we also have them focus for their career success on their discipline and on research in their discipline, not the holistic notion of what a student is. So some of the changes probably have to go way back to how we train ourselves to become uh, academics, as we uh, like to refer to ourselves. Yeah, great. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes left. Slight detour from the questions that were on the board, um, and and thinking a little bit about some of the ideas that Sean was sharing, we ended up really talking a lot about how our own hybrid courses that exist, and at this table we had quite a few examples, um, were innovative and and the strategy we might be able to, we're already using and that we might be able to develop to focus a little bit more on recruitment and retention of bachelor students in our various programs, um, and really with a focus on being responsive to them. What, was, what would be ideal? How do we decide how many hours in a hybrid class are in the classroom versus 
what's online? And do we need to change that for different courses, even within the same program? And how might we be able to do that and jigsaw that together? So we talked a lot about that, and we talked about the need for shell courses for those hybrid courses so that um, we have as much consistency and predictability for students as possible across programs, regardless of the class that they were taking. Yeah, let me ask a question. Uh, how many of you uh, teach or have taught? Most of us. Okay. Leave your hand up if you were trained sometime by your university or your discipline on how to create an online or a, a hybrid course. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. Many, many faculty have not, and that's one of the challenges we have. Faculty who want to do it uh, don't know how to do it. I mean, they, they, they don't know how to create the, they know how to uh, tape a lecture, videotape a lecture, but they don't know how to create. I, I sometimes joke that I, I think the disruptive moment uh, will, where do you go, Sean? The, the true dis uh, disruptive moment when, will, uh, uh, will be when Hanks and Spielberg create a MOOC on, uh, on history. <laughs> I guess they kind of do that from time to time, don't they? Uh, and they charge us twelve dollars to see it. As soon as they figure out they could create a freshman class and charge two hundred and fifty dollars for their class, you know, let's get out of the way. So, ma'am. Okay, so uh, we kind of discussed a, a number of different areas too. Some around the questions, some off topic as well. We uh, were bad in that we didn't write it down in the center, but um, one of the things that we were sort of discussing were, was uh, the topic of employers uh, looking at um, drilling down past skills and really looking for students who were equipped and better prepared with soft skills, communication, uh, different ways to um, become more professional employees, you know, having the knowledge to be able to um, come to a work environment and know how to, you know, be successful at a job, um, you know, that those kind of things are equally as important to many employer, employers as the hard skills, quote unquote hard skills. Um, Sean had mentioned this T model that I think is pretty, you know, apropos where all the, the vertical of the T are the hard skills and the perpendicular of the T are the soft skills and so employers are looking more for these T employees versus the ones that are just what the eyes, <laughs> the breadth and depth, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and you know, I think that also really speaks to the advantage of, of liberal arts education. You know, to that end, uh, also touching on what Elliot spoken about in terms of the Renaissance way of thinking about the world more holistically and from many different vantage points. Uh, the importance of that, I think, is unfortunately overlooked in a lot of segments of our, our uh, jobs. Yeah. Places. And my experience in talking to employers that hire central grads is if the, uh, if the, the smaller employers, the, let's say the lighting constructions that are looking for construction uh, engineers, for which an employee has a real big impact because they don't have a million of them, you know, that, that they really are looking for that, that whole person that's going to put value added, not for the very narrow skill they might be. A larger company might be looking, at least in my experience. And because you didn't write it down, too, cookies are coming about too? <laughs> they don't get a cookie. Watch them, watch them, watch them. They can even get their cookies. Okay. <laughs> go, go. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Good afternoon. Um, the table, um, we had a little great discussion um, for education and workforce development primarily. Um, so, um, several of us are um, really um, integrated into the business community um, through the work that we do, so that was kind of what our focus was. So, for far as credentials and skills, we also talked about um, soft skills. Um, what we hear from employers is um, strong uh, verbal and written communication skills, um, a sense of teamwork, being able to play with your coworkers well, and also um, one thing that employers have done. Leave your cell phone in your locker. Um, you know that is a huge thing um, for some employers. Um, a, a sense of a work ethic, um, showing up on time every day, following company rules, policies, procedures. Um, we had one employer that stated that um, 
with some of the, the younger workforce that their experience has been that oftentimes it takes them five jobs before they finally catch on to that, that, oh, okay, this is something that is, is really important. Um, utilizing apprenticeships, um, of course, they have their pros and cons. Um, strong induction programs, which is what um, the accelerated um, teacher program here um, uses. Um, you can probably speak more to that than I'm sorry. Um, and then exposing kids um, earlier, um, not waiting until high school, maybe possibly going in. I'm really dating myself here, but I remember back in the day we used to have um, career days where you know you could bring in mom or dad and they would talk about what they did for a living and how they got there, um, their career path, that kind of thing. So um, bringing that back possibly. Um, and for the future, um, some ideas that we um, had and talked about was. Um, more competency-based resumes rather than specific, um, I think you call them like laser focus sort of resumes, um, competency-based, um, credit for life experience over specific industry experience, you know, comparing a recent graduate to someone who's already been um, in a career for, for many years, and rethinking job descriptions and job requirements, um, employers like um, the degree versus experience, you know, how, how can you, um, weigh those out and maybe even looking at some you know competency based assessment tools to you know kind of flesh that out as well. So that's what we came up with. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> any other comments that didn't come up or any comments across the groups that anybody wants to to make? Yes ma'am. I'm not an educator. <laughs> Um, that means you know more than we do about but, this subject, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I, have, oh, I have worked in human resources. Um, and my husband and I have both done the in-school and online courses. And I think one of the things that's been most advantageous, and especially for Marcus and his advanced degree, um, doing it online because he was on the road 97% of the time, is that he had an opportunity to connect with other professionals in other fields all over the country and even in a couple of foreign countries and really glean from what their, um, what their specifications were and, and the experiences that they've had and he found that invaluable. So I guess my thought is that rather than just have an online course that specifically a specific university based, but if they could partner with other universities and gain information and experience from different um, areas of exper expertise and job experience, that might be more useful. Yeah, it probably would be. Difficult to, those things exist a little bit, but what we're really, I think, as an industry, kind of parochial, it's our course, it's our, you know, transfer credits, and we probably shouldn't be. I think it's not to the advantage of the student, you're right. It's we really think about student credit hours and, and those sorts of uh, those sorts of things. But you're right, those kind of hybrid, not just hybrid, but multi-institutional courses, uh, yeah. they exist, but they're, they're, they're not common. That yeah. is in my experience. But he found that very, very... Absolutely. You know, I, I'll tell a quick story, and then we'll, we'll, I'll introduce... Uh, Matthew, I think it illustrates a little bit of what we're talking about. I have one son, very traditional uh, student. He went to a four-year university, graduated four years, wanted uh, some greater skill sets, got his master's degree, got his master's degree in two years. He's now teaching. Um, normal pathway. Another son, and he's in the arts. And my other son, our younger son, um, went to three universities in, in three years. <laughs> picking ones that uh, were the best for him at that time and amassed a fair number of credits, a very bright uh, man, and then dropped out because he couldn't, he wanted to, he realized he wanted to go into software engineering, but he couldn't find a, uh, he has taken the courses in, you know, conceptual programming, uh, object oriented, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but he couldn't find anybody to help him in the language that he wanted to go, he wanted to start moving into virtual reality. So he taught himself and went to conferences and learned through, through conferences. Then he um, got a job with a startup company 
and they're paying him well. He's got a piece of equity. It might work. It might not work. He knows that. But he doesn't know the, some of the science behind the graphics. So he takes, if he needs something, he goes online and takes a free course at Stanford or a free course at MIT or whatever, learns the content, and then, you know, then brings that content down into his environment. And he probably has a mass, not necessarily on transcript, because a lot of this stuff is, is just open, uh, more than enough credits for a master's degree, but he has no degree. And my wife, when he comes over Christmas, my wife said, your dad's a university president, and you don't have a college degree. I mean, come on, dude, just just finish it. I, I don't care what. And my wife doesn't call him dude. It's a whole other conversation, but uh, in this context. But, the, but he'll just say, well, you know, with all due respect, a bachelor's degree is a construct of your generation. <laughs> and it's hard to argue with, because he knows what he needs to know. And... He's broadly educated. That's what he did his first two years. So he, he designed his pathway through the educational system and got and he is where he wants to be in. And he said, someday maybe I'll finish it before dad dies, just to, so you know that I'm I'm but I know in my heart he has no intention of doing that. That's just a way of, of you know, that's like past the gravy uh, at, at, uh, at Thanksgiving. So so it is something we have to grapple with. Students are, are doing that more and more. Students are taking uh, two years with Linda and then taking you know, two years at Central as an intentional path. These are not students that are place bound or financially strapped. It just works into their life better. Then they're, I say they spend two years with me, then they move over to one of the centers we have on the west side to get their internship. They are engineering their pathway through uh, through the university in ways that uh, we didn't design into the basic uh, system. There were, and we probably didn't do. I'm looking at people my age. There's only a couple of us in the room. We didn't think of doing that, did we? I'm going to three or four. You're not this old yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just lucky to get into a university. <laughs>